everyone and welcome to the latest Global Outlook video from the Economist Intelligence Unit. My name is Agathe Demarais and I'm the Global Forecasting Director at the EIU. I'm joined today by Robert Wood, the Principal Economist of our Latin America team based in New York, and Benedict Craven, the Principal Economist of our Middle East and Africa team based in London. Today we're going to discuss the outlook in 2021 for Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Before we start, one word about our latest revisions to our global growth forecasts. We now believe that global output is going to contract by 5% this year. And there will only be a partial rebound next year with growth of 4.6%. Overall, this means that the years 2020 and 2021 will be lost for growth because global output will not recover to pre-coronavirus levels before at least 2022. These forecasts are pretty grim, but they mask wide disparities across regions. So let's explore them today. And to start, I'm going to turn to you, Rob, to discuss the outlook for Latin America. So my first question will be pretty simple. We saw that there was a, a rebound in Q3 across Latin America, but no, the recovery seems to have slowed. What's the outlook for Latin America next year? Hi, everybody. Um... In Latin America is probably going to grow by just over 3% next year. Um, that's going to be weaker than the, the global average. And also, of course, the region fell more sharply in 2020. Uh, and we don't really expect full recoveries in the region until 2022, probably more 2023. The, the pace and shape of the recovery is going to be this sort of Nike swoosh. Uh, we've already sort of seen this rebound in the in the third quarter, and that will continue with a gradual partial recovery next year. Uh, there will be a, a sort of variance across the region. So we see countries like Chile, Peru, and Colombia performing a bit better than the other countries. We see modest recoveries in both Brazil and Mexico. A lot of countries will struggle though, um, particularly the likes of Argentina uh, and Ecuador that sort of came into the pandemic with pre-existing economic problems, and despite their recent external debt restructurings, will suffer. Also, the Caribbean is going to still sort of uh, struggle to recover from uh, the hit from tourism. Uh, looking then at the, on the demand side and then on the supply side, so firstly on the demand side, we do see some positives. So we have still a commodity international uh, monetary conditions and also local conditions. So we see very low policy rates and very low inflation. However, um, unemployment is going to be very high in the teens in many countries. And the main drag on growth is going to be this need of governments to dial back the fiscal stimulus of 2020 next year. Uh, on the supply side, we see the primary sector doing pretty well, that recovered uh, you know, pretty quickly uh, from the crisis. Agriculture, uh, obviously it's uh, largely export oriented and also mining. And those sectors are going to do well from the, the global recovery, particularly uh, in China. Manufacturing and retail have recovered relatively quickly uh, in some of these countries, and that will continue. But what's going to lag is the services sector. And that's the biggest sector in the economies of uh, most of these countries uh, in the region. And we're still going to see um, sectors that are sensitive to social distancing requirements uh, lagging the recovery. So I'm thinking, uh, tourism, uh, travel, uh, personal services, etc. That's going to lag behind and that's going to weigh on the upturn. And a lot of course is going to depend uh, on the deployment of vaccines across the region. And you know a lot of um, a lot of the public health systems are quite extensive in Latin America, particularly in places like Brazil. Uh, but nevertheless it's going to be quite a challenge to deploy them given the uh, the large populations living in uh, informal uh, conditions. So actually, Rob, you, you just mentioned Brazil, which was an interesting example because we've seen massive fiscal stimulus in Brazil this year. Do we think that they will put uh, the fiscal situation on a more sustainable path during next year? What's our forecast for that? Well, that's, that's the big question. Uh, as you say, uh, stimulus was, uh, was considerable in Brazil very important to, uh, to support the poor. Uh, it's a very ex extensive cash transfer program. That's lifted the fiscal deficit, uh, we estimate around 16% of GDP uh, this year, which is huge. Uh, 
And that's going to take Brazil into 2021 with a very high debt burden. So around 100% of GDP. Um, lower than in advanced economies, the average is around 120% in advanced economies, but that's going to be the, the highest amongst emerging markets. Now, investors uh, like in you know, Brazil and in other countries have given policymakers some room, not just because of the low uh, debt servicing costs with low interest rates, but also uh, on the belief that after the pandemic, governments will dial back this stimulus. Now, Brazil does have a, a strong fiscal framework that they have to return to. Uh, if they don't, then there's a risk that sort of this environment of low interest rates and low inflation will reverse. And that has been, you know, that is a positive for Brazil going into 2021. And we would see sort of return to higher interest rates and higher inflation. A lot will depend then on pressure for social uh, spending. Uh, we think the government will be successful in dialing down these cash transfers to a level that will permit them to stay within these austere public spending cap rules, which are sort of a, a fiscal straitjacket. And a lot of p politicians want to wriggle out of this straitjacket. Um, not only in 2021, but of course, 2022 is then uh, an election year and the president will be looking for re-election. And these cash transfers have obviously been very popular amongst the poor. So there will be strong pressures there to increase social spending. Our baseline is though, that Brazil will stay uh, within the fiscal rules, but investors will be monitoring this very carefully. So maybe turn into the second largest economy in the region, Mexico. Mexico embarked on a different path. There was no fiscal stimulus there. So what are your thoughts for Mexico's outlook in 2021? Well, we see Mexico growing a little over 3%, uh, perhaps slightly more than Brazil. But then the contraction in 2020 much, was much deeper, 9%. Um, so, you know, overall, the performance is, is weaker, I think, than in, than in Brazil. Uh, I think a lot of attention, particularly international investors, will be around this question that's been lingering for quite a while as to whether Mexico will lose its investment grade rating. Uh, whether that happens next year or in the medium term, the probability is rising. Uh, they have passed a very austere um, budget for 2021, but that might not help them out if other macroeconomic, the macroeconomic conditions weigh on Mexico's, out, uh, on Mexico's outlook. But we've also been looking at other things that have perhaps sort of flown under the, the radar a bit, which we think are quite interesting in Mexico next year. And one is uh, around labor market dynamics. Uh, so a couple of trends here. One is around rising labor incomes, which could be a positive for a private consumption. Now, the government uh, of Andres uh, Manuel López Obrador, since taking office, has raised the minimum wage about 40% and is likely to continue raising the minimum wage as a support for the poor. Uh, and there are also the provisions in the US, Canada, Mexico, Mexico agreement mean that wages in the automotive sector need to be higher. That's been pressuring uh, wages up in, in Mexico. Uh, also, other stipulations in the agreement mean that it's easier for our workers to unionize, and that's something that we haven't really seen in the past. And we could start to see some, uh, some, uh, some more sort of labor disputes that haven't been a feature of the labor market uh, in, in Mexico in the past. So that's a positive, that's a potential downside for the labor market and industrial relations uh, in 2021 and beyond. Um, a positive is um, we're looking at sort of potential openings for the private sector in infrastructure through uh, public-private partnerships. Now, the AMLO government uh, you know, hasn't had a great relationship with the private sector, uh, particularly sort of clamping down on private investment in the energy sector. We don't think there'll be many opportunities in the energy sector, which will still be state led by the state oil company Pemex. But I think there will be opportunities, particularly in transport and telecommunications to, uh, to get private investment in. Then other, the third area that we're, we're looking at are the midterm uh, local, the midterm elections in Mexico. To see the extent to which we could, we could observe a fraying of the party political system and potentially a change to um, the, uh, the big change in politics, uh, not necessarily at the midterm stage, but more at the end of AMLO's term in 2024. So we'll be looking at questions around uh, low turnout, 
uh, whether that would open the open space for uh, for a uh, for a, an anti-establishment figure to emerge. There are there are no positions up for election of public office in these midterms. It's congressional. However, if we see low turnout, that could suggest there's some dissatisfaction with the uh, with the political system. That could open things up going forward. Thanks so much, Rob. So let's turn to Ben now to discuss the outlook for Africa in 2021. So maybe Ben, an easy question, I'm not sure it's that easy, but a general question to start with. What's the growth outlook for a region in 2021? Yeah, so um, in 2020, some Af it's a variegated picture. Some um, countries in Africa have done reasonably okay considering all the pandemic disruptions, and that's mainly in agrarian economies, so some of the smaller economies. Um, where agriculture's, because of good harvests, have done quite well, and because that comprises such a large share of GDP, contractions have been reasonably small. But then you've got the major economies, South Africa and Nigeria, who are both going to enter into pretty deep contractions. South Africa, 8%, Nigeria, by just over a bit, of, a bit over 3%. And pretty much everywhere, you've got these ginormous fiscal overhangs that have re-emerged. Africa was just recovering from the commodity price crash in 2015-16, and it had taken governments that long to build up some fiscal buffers, which have now evaporated again. Um, so our projection for 2021 is pretty bleak at 1.2%. Um, and that's a very slow recovery because um, governments are really, again, have no fiscal buffers with which you continue stimulus. Um, lockdowns may have eased, but governments are going to have to enter into austerity mode very quickly uh, and without the, the adequate time for the private sector to pick up the slack. And that's a big problem. Uh, over the next five years, even, Africa's really got to move away from a state-led uh, investment model towards a private-led investment model. And to be fair, we've seen some, in, some incredible um, acceleration in reforms. Uh, so in Nigeria, we've seen probably in the last five months more reform progress than in the last five years under Buhari. Um, you've seen petrol prices being deregulated, power sector reforms badly needed in South Africa. The ANC government's finally recognising that something needs to be done about ESCOM the power utility that's so indebted um, and has been holding the, uh, the entire industrial sector back through power outages. But these are going to take time to filter through into actionable private investments. Um, so unfortunately, until that happens, Africa's growth outlook for 2021 is, is very, very muted. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, global monetary policies obviously going to be very loose and in the long term, that's going to be supported as well. Um, but we've had ultra loose global monetary conditions, you know, since the financial crisis, and that hasn't really translated into an FDI boom for Africa, which has a chronic problem with low savings, uh, which doesn't meet investment needs. So it's hard to see how, even though ultra loose financing conditions going forward are often being touted as a positive for the continent, how that's actually going to translate into an FDI boom when it hasn't in the past. So we have some areas where reforms are opening up, but it's not going to happen quick enough um, for the private sector to pick up the slack. And that's largely why we're forecasting a pretty dismal growth outlook for 2021 at least. How about debt? There's been a lot of discussions at the um, IMF and World Bank annual meetings around debt in poorer countries, such as countries in Africa. So what's the outlook for debt? Are we, are we worried about the debt pass for many African countries? Yeah, so in the near term, it's, it's very stressful. Um, there was a moratorium on debt servicing to G20 countries, their bilateral debts. Um, and that's been extended uh, six months into next year. But crucially, China's been quite resistant to a, a larger debt relief package. China's obviously Africa's biggest bilateral creditor and has vested interest in them um, continuing with payments. And Chinese commercial creditors haven't been included. Um, so in the near term, the international response doesn't really amount to much. Um, and you've also got private debts, um, independent of Chinese commercial debts, that aren't included. Um, African sovereigns wouldn't even want the private sector in many cases to become involved in a restructure or, or relief deal because they're worried about what it would do to their credit worthiness. Um, so in the near term, governments really do have to carry this servicing burden pretty much as it was prior to COVID. Um, and also with the backdrop of what I said earlier, being a, a very slow economic recovery. Um, so where the IMS been involved, that's been, that's been essential. Uh, the IMF has shown that you can actually get restructures on Chinese commercial credits that happened with Angola. Um, but where countries are sort of closed out from the IMF and don't have the institutional backing to pursue restructures, you're seeing cracks emerge. And, and Zambia famously is, is, is entering, or missed a Eurobond payment, 
is now winding down the clock to a grace period where a lot of people are expecting, including us, for them to default. Um, the medium term is a little bit better. That's purely based on quite a positive commodity price outlook driven by Chinese industrial demand, um, especially for key commodities for African producers like copper, which are essential for uh, electric car manufacturing. Um, so that's kind of positive enough for the continent to get by without a wave of defaults. Um, but debt servicing is going to remain hugely stressful. Um, Africa is largely going to be in survival mode over the medium term with regard to debt servicing. And one of the issues that's sort of been under the radar in 2020, but will re-emerge in the radar in 2021, is migration. If governments are going to have to enter into a long period of fiscal austerity, um, either through tax hikes, which had investment, or through spending cuts, you're not going to see unemployment come down from astronomically high levels in a lot of countries. Uh, that's obviously been increased further in 2020 because of coronavirus. Um, and what does that lead to? That leads to migration. Migration leads to insecurity because... Uh, people trafficking networks are tied in with all sorts of um, uh, terror cells and destabilizing forces. And that's going to uh, end up being an EU problem. So our thinking at the moment is that um, the EU is going to want to do something uh, a bit bigger than the international community, the G20, have done. Um, and possibly we're going to move towards a HIPAC 3, uh, which wouldn't be the kind of reset that it was in 2005. Uh, this is a big write-off in 2005 because of private debts, um, but we're thinking that, that essentially it's going to be unavoidable for the EU to be able to ignore the problem of African debt. So you've mentioned China, and China is obviously a very, very big player for debt in Africa and many emerging countries. It has a portfolio of loans that is twice larger than the IMF and the World Bank combined. So what sort of view, do you think that China could go a step further with African debt restructurings maybe, or some debt relief? What are your thoughts around this? So I think that the, the message China's given to African countries is so mixed, it's, it's damaging by itself. As I said, Angola, they've agreed to a restructure, that's six billion in Chinese commercial credits, uh, that was done through the IMF. But then you've got Zambia, who's also a really important strategic partner for Africa, uh, for China in Africa. Um, and Zambia has got no debt relief whatsoever. It hasn't got um, an IMF program in place, but uh, Chinese commercial creditors haven't agreed to a restructuring of playing hardball, you might say, with Zambia, and now Zambia has actually fallen into loan arrears with them. So it's a, it's a mixed message that Zambia has sent to African countries that it's lent to. Um, as I said, I think the era of, pub of public capital investment in Africa is certainly over, uh, and that's what drove a lot of the relationship with China, because it was through bilateral um, or commercial credit lines. So I think if China is going to remain a key integral part of the African growth story, it's going to have to completely restructure its entire um, relationship, because it's not going to be done through debt anymore, because African governments aren't going to be interested in those kind of infrastructure projects they were in the past. Um, and so it's going to have to switch to FDI, and I think that's where it's interesting. China hasn't been that committed in regard to FDI to Africa, um, especially not recently. There were white elephant projects uh, in the last decade. Many of them turned unprofitable, and China was widely seen as sort of retreating from the FDI model. So it's, it's going to be an interesting few years where the nature of the relationship is going to be laid bare as being a credited debtor model, uh, which just doesn't work anymore. So I think if Africa still sees, sorry, if China still sees Africa as, uh, as an important source of commodities, which we believe it, it, it will, um, it's going to be an interesting to see how the, uh, the story plays out, because it's going to have to be on FDI rather than debt in the future. Thanks so much, Ben, and thanks so much, Rob, for your thoughts. We're going to the end of our video now. You can always find our latest analysis on our website, www.eau.com, with our latest white papers and analysis on topics such as US-China relations under a Biden administration, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on supply chains across the world, or also the US presidential election, which is quite a topical issue at the moment. You can also follow us on Twitter uh, at the EI you or again check our website for our latest analysis. I look forward to re uh, recording the next Global Outlook video next month and in the meantime stay safe and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, goodbye.